We hear it every day. Climate change is coming, and there's going to be global repercussions. Millions of people are going to be forced to leave their homes as heavily populated areas become completely flooded by rising sea levels, such as Boston, Manhattan, Florida, and DC. According to estimates by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, sea levels could rise by as many as 6.6 feet by 2100. A researcher by the name of Nicolay Lamb wanted to see what these statistics would look like in real life. And with the help of Climate Central, he created these GIFs to help show these specific effects of climate change. Here's what the Back Bay neighborhood of Boston is going to look like with these projected increases. If this happens today, it's going to displace the 26,000 people currently living there. Here's what Miami, Florida and Washington, D.C. are going to look like with these projected increases. Imagine what this is going to look like on a global scale. But this is what Chicago is going to look like. Exactly the same. We're lucky to live in a city that's borders are going to be virtually untouched by these specific effects of climate change. But it begs the question, why should we care? Unfortunately for us, it appears that climate change is going to be impacting a lot more than we may realize. Due to the current trends of global temperature increase, decrease in average rainfall, and the depletion of the soil nutrition on lands that we currently cultivate, it looks like we're going to be saying goodbye to a lot of our favorite foods. That morning cup of joe, guacamole in your burrito and chipotle, these foods, once seen as commonplace, can soon become luxuries only the mega-rich can afford. Here's a list of foods we can look to say goodbye to in the next 30 years. Pasta. Wine. Honey. Beer. Rice. Corn. Coffee. Chocolate. Seafood. Maple syrup. Beans. Cherries. Avocados. Apples. Peanuts and potatoes. Don't believe me? As our temperature increases, while well, our average rainfall decreases, the soil nutrition is just going to be too low. For example, coffee farming has already been devastated by global temperature increase, allowing a bacteria called coffee rust to dramatically decrease the yield of coffee in Central America. That's right, no more coffee. I trust that I have your attention now. <laughs> But one item on this list that surprises a lot of people is seafood. One might think that with rising sea levels, we might also see an increase in fish stock. But the reality is that our aquatic life is dying at a rate unprecedented to any point in our history. This is due in large part to dead zones. Dead zones are created by toxic runoffs from our industrial meat industry and other agricultural practices finding, our way, finding their way into our oceans. This is one of 550 dead zones in the world today. This specific dead zone spans 8,700 square miles of uninhabitable land filled with dead aquatic life. For another instance of our industrial agricultural practices impacting on aquatic life, let's look to Florida. Where toxic, green, slime-like algae appear, making the water uninhabitable for both animals and humans. Or, to bring it closer to home, how about just a couple of months ago? when a blue whale washed up like this in its stomach. So why do I care? Yes, I love sushi. And without a doubt, the thought of never having a beer kind of freaks me out. <laughs> I mean, you have to wait 21 years to get this stuff. But it's more than that. I'd like to take a step back and think about when this all clicked for me. When I realized there was a problem, and we had to do something about it fast. In the seventh grade, a few of my friends and I were challenged by our middle school biology teacher to fix something. Instead of the normal science fair every school has, our teacher hosted an innovation fair. And he challenged us to find a problem we found interesting and attempt to fix it. We recalled seeing the documentary Food Inc. and the light bulb went off. This documentary goes into extreme detail about what's wrong with the industrial agricultural process in America. And this is what sparked my interest in the situation as a whole. But sadly, the more that I learned, the more despair I had. But equally, the more conviction I had in trying to make a difference in addressing this issue. When we watched this movie back in the seventh grade, we were blown away with how inefficient many of our agricultural practices were, and how costly they were for the planet. So we decided to do something about it. We decided to build an aquaponic farm for our school to have fresh greens and fresh fish from for our student-run business. This was our finished product. 
Now let's get real. This project itself was classic seventh grade, if you get my drift. A for effort, a whole lot of passion, a lot of duct tape, but ultimately a bunch of dead tilapia. <laughs> but that wasn't the point, and I guess the teachers knew that. The point was, it opened my eyes up to a whole part of my day-to-day -day reality that I took for granted. Food. Food is everywhere, and you don't have to think about it. It's in your fridge, it's at the grocery store, it's in my lunchbox. And if you call, tweet, or think, it can be delivered anywhere. If you, if you pause and reflect for a moment on the broader issue, or even imagine life without that killer slice of Polly's pizza across the road, you're going to get concerned. This project made me think about sustainability, something I had never really thought about. I never realized its importance, or its attainability. Here I was, a seventh grader, making a sustainable farm. It was very doable. It struck me that I could do something about a major issue. That's why I'm talking here today. This seventh grade aquaponics farm, aquaponic tank, made from a few fence posts, a donated lamp, a fish tank and some pumps, isn't very special. I'm talking to you today because of what this innovation fair did for me. I'm talking to you today because my seventh grade teacher challenged us to innovate and change the world rather than recreate or imitate and recreate the problem. Innovation is liberating. It demands that you look at things through a different lens, that you discard fear, second guessing, that you fail fast and learn from what didn't work that you apply creativity and never take failure personally. This is what I hope to challenge all of you to do, to innovate today, to solve the problems of tomorrow. We need people to reimagine the way we farm and help save our planet. But all across the world, our brightest scientists and innovators are coming up with mind-blowing new ways of farming that comes at virtually zero cost to the environment. Chicago has already been the center of an agricultural and farming revolution. Here in the 1870s, we saw the invention of refrigerated meat transport, which revolutionized the meat industry and created an entirely new market within the food sector. George Hammond from Detroit built and patented a refrigerated, transport, a refrigerated meat transport car that set the stage for the built and patented a refrigerated transport car and built a meat packing plant in northern Indiana that was so important to the area they named a town after him. Hammond, Indiana. Gustavo Swift advanced this work and built more sophisticated transport cars that set the stage for Chicago's transformation of the meat industry into an efficient, continent-wide transportation system that set, much, that set the stage for much of the expansion of cities out west. Let's do it again. Let's make sure that Chicago is at the center and the forefront of another agricultural revolution. Let's follow the footsteps of companies like Aero Farms, in New York City, which can currently outproduce a field farmer by 130 times. This means that for every one acre a field farmer can get, an urban farm can get 130. All of this without using any fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. There are no inputs while using 95% less water. Let's follow the footsteps of Dubai, who are now making sustainable neighborhoods with greenhouses in the center. Luckily for us, this work's already being done today in Chicago by companies such as The Plant, a fully functioning, fully sustainable urban farm in one of the abandoned meatpacking warehouses, or Omni Ecosystems, a nonprofit organization who claim to have over five acres of farmable rooftops within the city, or the very school where I had my innovation fit, who have a fully functioning urban farm with goats, chickens, and enough greens to feed 500 hungry kids most school lunch times. According to the Tribune, Chicago has over 230 community gardens and 60 urban farms. Wherever you look, the products of an innovation fair can be seen. So, I'm finished. I know what needs doing and what I need to do. But the question is, what are you going to do? You can do what you've always done and kick the can down the road and have someone else pick it up later. Or you can pick the can up and transform it into something that's going to reshape the way we interact with our food. It's time to care. Thank you.